firearms that influence the Powder River country. I am Carrie Edinger. I'm the historic program manager for the Sheridan Community Land Trust. And we are one of the four partners to put on this program today. Um, today's program explores history along the Bozeman Trail, early cattle drives, western settlement, and how early firearms and Indian weaponry, weaponry, it's a tricky word, um, kind of influenced those historical moments. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that today admission is free at the fort, thanks to the Sheridan County Sportsmen's Association. So in between programs, if you have time to visit the fort grounds and also look at the interpretive sites, um, please do, admission is free. Um, the program has been a year in the making, and the partnerships are the Fort Phil Kearney Historical Site, Fort Phil Kearney Bozeman Trail Association, the Sheridan Community Land Trust, and the Sheridan County Sportsman Association. Um, we will be video recording all the presentations today, and that is thanks to the Wyoming Humanities Council. And I wanted to introduce this morning's presenters. Um, Bob Wilson, he is the retired superintendent of the Fort Phil Kearney State Historical Site. He is the leader of the Fort Kearney Regulars and the co-editor of Lookout Newsletter. Donovan Sprague, he is the Sheridan College History and Political Science faculty, an enrolled member of the Mini Koju Lakota, and he is also on the advisory board of the Fort Phil Kearney Bozeman Trail Association. It's hard to get away from long titles with history. <laughs> <That's my laughs> um, they both have many accomplishments, and also we are so happy to have all their historical knowledge here today. And I can go on about all those accomplishments, but I want you guys to start the program. And thank you for doing this. Yes. Let's give a little applause. Anyway, I'm Bob Wilson, and I'm going to cover basically the military weapons, that kind of thing, along the Powder River. I'm just going to kind of go through it, following the history. <clears throat> Donovan will come back after me, and he'll go into a lot of detail on the Native American equipment and weapons, and that kind of thing. So I've got the mannequin set up around the room here. Uh, so begin with this sort of Crow Indian here at the end. And uh, at that time, this would be around the 1850s. And they were, they, at the fort here, they know that about 10% of the natives that were fighting against the soldiers had weapons. Uh, and that was it. Most of their weapons were pretty poor quality, actually. They did have trade guns, which is the, the long gun leading up against the wall. But they cut them down, so they're more like that little short one. In the in the West, the natives would take it. They would, England and America later, and France all made trade guns for the Native Americans to trade furs. Thank you, uh, hides, you know, furs and that kind of thing. Not only did they trade beads, but they traded guns. At the fort here, the natives could come into the fort and buy arrowheads and axe heads, a lot of metal things, they could even buy weapons. Um, but at the time, most of them were carrying these trade guns. We found one at this fort and one down at Fort Reno, and there was a third one somewhere in between. Um, but they were single shot, flintlock, and running around somewhere between anywhere from 50 caliber to 69 caliber. Uh, by that, 50 caliber is a half inch diameter. Uh, so they, they got pretty big. Um, but they would, in the west, they cut them off because they were using them more on horseback. In the east, where they, the woods and stuff, they, they pretty well left the guns the way they received them, which were long barreled. They, they were all unrifled, and they were all flintlocks generally. Uh, but they cut them off so they could load them real easily on horseback. They would put several rounds, round balls in their mouth and I have a little can of powder or something, they weren't really specific on the amount of powder they dumped down the barrel, but they'd be able to hold the gun kind of under their arm and dump some powder down it, spit a ball down it, tap the end of it or the butt of it on their hip or on their saddle, and then it was loaded. And 
they weren't looking for accuracy at long range, they'd ride right up to their target and shoot it. Um, this, that's around the time of the fort. But in the 10 years between Fort Field Kearney and the Little Bighorn, the Native American weaponization really grew. Uh, here at the Fetterman fight, the bows and arrows were probably a better weapon than the muskets, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Because the Indians could, 75 yards was pretty much a reasonable target, and they could have five arrows, six arrows in the air before you got hit by the first one. So the Surgeon General who studied arrow wounds said that anybody that got hit by one arrow generally got hit by two from the same person. Uh, so they're real lethal with their arrows, but they do it on horseback, galloping under the horse. What? Well, the soldier who, by the time of the fort here, has a muzzle loader, has to stand there, basically load, it takes about 30 seconds to load his rifle, and with the arrows and everything flying by, during the Fetterman fight, when it's really cold out, they did not wear gloves. Uh, they couldn't use their weapons or operate their weapons with gloves on. So uh, they were, they were, <laughs> had worse weapons actually at the Fetterman fight than the natives did with bows and arrows, I, from what I can tell. Uh, but I'll, I'll kind of jump back. The next figure would have been a mountain man out here on the plains. And uh, he would have started out with a rifled uh, flintlock. Uh, slow loading, probably take about a minute to load one of those. They came in fairly, they would, their preferred caliber is like 50 or 54 caliber. And they would carry either a cap and ball pistol, or per, probably start with a flintlock, but then that's what it's there for. <laughs> uh, now they did take several flintlocks. And actually converted them over to cap and ball. And they would look, this is an original just cap and ball, but a lot of them would look a lot like this converted over here. You know. And some of them are huge caliber, like 69 caliber, which can't imagine shooting in that, they would tear your arm off. Of <laughs> but uh, the black powder is a little bit different than modern powder. It pushes you more, it burns slower, so it, it doesn't have a kick. Uh, but that's the kind of weapons they carried, and they advanced quickly to cap and uh, ball and uh, they did a lot of the trading with the natives with firearms that kind of thing. A lot of the, a lot more of the firearm trading happened in the east with Native Americans. Then once they got out here, it was a little less. So that's why the natives around here didn't quite have as many weapons until the Little Bighorn or prior, just in the five years probably prior to the Little Bighorn, they started really gaining weapons. They were getting them from the reservation and from the military and just buying them from traders and that kind of thing. So at the fort here, they're Civil War soldiers. They're carrying the same weapons in the Civil War. So when the cavalry, which is this first sergeant right here, his first weapon, they arrived, were called star carbines. And they were a paper cartridge carbine that had a nipple on it. So you would load your paper cartridge when you close the action it would cut the back off, and then you put a percussion cap on it and fired it. They converted them and made a metal cartridge and fired the same ammunition as Spitzer carbine fire. And that's what they used up until about two weeks before the Fetterman fight. They had an engagement on December 6th here, and when they got back to the fort, a lot of the officers were complaining about the star carbines. It, they shot too slow, that kind of thing. Well, they do that the band, there was a regimental band at the fort that had Spitzer carbines, which were the premier carbine of the military. They were never formally issued to the military. They were given to a lot of militia units during the <coughs> Civil War. And then the band, I, I don't even understand really why the band would have been carrying them, except that they were a dress unit and the Spitzer would have been the fanciest weapon around, so they gave them the Spitzers. Well, when he got back on December 6th, Carrington had give the band the star carbines and all the, the cavalry got the Spencer carbines. Uh, there were seven shot repeaters and uh, fairly effective, pretty effective weapon. Uh, pretty, pretty heavy caliber, 56 caliber. This glass just goes to work. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm going to catch one again. <laughs> So it ain't loaded.
anyhow. Uh, so the cavalry went into the Fetterman fight with the Spencer carbines. We don't know to this whether they had ever fired them before. They got them on December 6th. We've never found a gun range out here. So we have no idea what experience the cavalry got with the Spencers when they went into the battle. Uh, and they had 32 rounds of ammunition, which is, yeah, that was it. And the Spencers show up, there's a couple of them show up at the uh, Fetterman or the Wagon Box fight. Uh, the natives have some at the Wagon Box fight too. We try, we compared our artifacts from the battlefield up here with the artifacts at the Little Bighorn, hoping that some of the Spencer rounds and Henry rounds that we had here might match something up there, but nothing matched. So in 10 years, everything must have changed a lot. But, so later on, like I said, he's, he's leaning up against the star carving that he has a Spencer hanging on him, and he would have also carried a 45 caliber pistol, Remington, like this. Cavalry, every man was issued at the Remington pistol at Fort Phil Kearney. The day of the Fetterman fight, they did not take them out. They were locked in the magazine most of the time, except when something was going on, but because Fetterman and the infantry had left a little bit earlier ahead of Grumman and the cavalry, Grumman had to hurry up and they didn't have time to stop at the magazine, draw their pistols, and load them. So they left the fort with just the Spencer carbines and their sabers uh, and left these by the fort. They didn't carry them or leave them in the barracks because they had a lot of card games and stuff going on in the barracks. <laughs> and so the soldiers were known to shoot each other on the right occasion and so they didn't want them to have the pistols available. The infantry came out here with the exact same weapons that most of them carried in the Civil War. However, about 50% of the infantry were new recruits. And so between those two groups, uh, you have soldiers that don't know how to use their muskets or load them properly, or in, you were trained in nine steps to load a musket. And if you knew that real well and could do it real well, you could probably fire, starting with a loaded rifle, fire three rounds a minute. Uh, however, since they weren't trained, we have no idea how, how slow the infantry were loading their muskets. <clears throat> the other ones, their muskets were, had gone all the way through four years of fighting in the Civil War, the ones they were carrying. So to give you the idea of the condition of their muskets, the morning of the Fetterman fight, 94 infantrymen volunteered to go out with Fetterman. Only 49 of them had serviceable muskets. So half of them, their muskets were worn out, basically. Uh, and so it's really a, when you read some of the wagon trains and stuff, you know, nowadays we think everybody's got to be carrying a weapon on a wagon train, you know, with the fear of being attacked and that kind of thing. Most of the drivers on their, on the military wagon trains were not armed. Half of the soldiers marching along with them were not armed. So you have the crazy woman fight down here <coughs> in the south of Buffalo, and they have like 20 soldiers in there, 10 of them don't have weapons. You have the Shirley fight over in East of Sheridan in November 67. They had all been issued weapons that summer. They'd been given the, the trapdoor weapons. And yet, for some reason, out of the 27 soldiers in the Shirley fight, like seven or eight of them aren't armed, don't have weapons. And I have yet to figure out why they were so short of weapons at times. They were always short of ammunition. This, this place was not, the fort was not given a lot of ammo. When he came out, when Carrington first came out here, he was short of ammunition. They used to shoot the wolves on guard duty. The wolves would prowl the stockade, the guards would shoot them. They had to stop doing that. Carrington had to stop doing that because he couldn't afford the powder or the lead because he's so short of lead and powder. Well, the Indians watched that happen. They were watching the fort constantly. So, warriors put get, uh, wolf capes over their backs and snuck down to the fort in the middle of the winter, killed the guards, shot them off their guard stand. So then he had to go back to shooting the wolves, but he was still short powder. 
and uh, led, after Carrington left and they'd gotten a new uh, breech loading rifles, which were cartridge weapons, uh, they uh, <coughs> had the wagon box fight and hayfield fight. And the post commander here, who's the regimental commander commanding all three forts, writes back saying, if I have two more battles like the two I just had, I will be out of ammunition. So that was kind of the we never found a shooting range, and they were constantly short of ammunition. And it was just kind of the story of this fort and the forts on the trail. Uh, so your infantryman, he carries a muzzle loader through up to roughly July of 67. They bring in and issue what were called uh, Allen conversions, which where they took the Springfield muzzle loader added a breech to it, so it's now a breech loader, and they put a tube inside the original barrel to, to take it down to 50 caliber instead of 58 caliber. And that's what they have at the wide box fight. Uh, but they're much faster shooting. They're, from three rounds, they went to about 10 rounds. So real quick, uh, that's what, that and the fact that they were in a fixed position behind wagon boxes, kept them alive during the wagon box fight, or the five or six hours of fighting there. Uh, NCOs at that time would have also carried pistols. Uh, officers would have carried uh, Navy, Navy Colts, like this. But they were purchased by the officer. He had to buy his own weapons, his own uniform, everything he had to buy for himself. But uh, the enlisted men were given the 44 Remingtons. So you go about 10 years and you're back out on the plains with Custer's men or the other cavalry uh, guys we got here. First, the first guy right back by the door there, he's infantry, would have been infantry in 60, starting in, in 1873, they converted uniforms, weapons, saddles, everything. But they had so much leftover equipment from the previous years or from the Civil War that you seldom saw a soldier walking around in regulation 1873 equipment. Most of them were still carrying four button blouses instead of five button blouses. A lot of them were wearing, the, the man on the right side here is wearing a four inch cap, whereas the man on the left side has got a kepi. Uh, up until 1873, a kepi was only worn by officers, and four inch caps were worn by the enlisted men. Uh, but after 73, they basically back and forth. But they also gave them slouch hats, bigger ones. Uh, I can't remember the name of the hat. It's a, looks like a naval admiral's hat. It pins up on both sides. You can see there's several pictures out there with Custer and his officers, all, a lot of them wearing that type of hat in the cavalry. Um, but to give you kind of an example of uniforms and equipment, in Custer's men, None of them were dressed the same. Each each person looking the same uniform, same boots. Some guys were wearing brogans, the shoes. Some guys were wearing just regular <coughs> infantry pants without the padding for a cavalryman. Uh, other guys were wearing four button blouses that uh, were used in the Civil War. Or they had another blouse that was real pleated. It had something like ten pockets inside of it. The pockets were all hidden in these pleats. You could. So they're amazing, you can't see any of the pockets if they're all there. Uh, some of them wore that. That was going to be a, a dress kind of uniform for a while, but they gave up on it pretty quickly. Uh, but they all were carrying breech loading rifles now. And uh, well, the infantry at Fort Phil Kearney ended up with 50 70 rifles, uh, the cavalry ended up with 45 55 carbines which some people call 4570 carbines, and the infantry had the 4570 rifles. And they were the same action as the Allen conversion trap doors, uh, which in reality is a fairly dangerous action. It's one of the more dangerous breech loading methods of loading the rifle. Uh, they had a lot better developed ones out there, but that's what the military chose. Uh, the military never would issue the Spencer carving, uh, repeating carvings to all their soldiers. They, they were really 
into fire control is what they call it. The officers want to be able to tell every man what to shoot at and when to shoot at. And if they could shoot more than one round, you know, real quickly, <laughs> like seven rounds in a Spencer carving, well, that was uncontrollable. The officers did not want them to have that ability. So the rifles they carry between 73 and probably eight, uh, 90s are single shots, uh, breech loaders. Now, with the Spanish-American War coming on, they actually ended up going to Denmark and getting uh, what were called 30, 40 Craigs, and they got the patent on them, and manu Springfield Company manufactured in the States. And that was the first real modern firearm for the military. It was a breech loading, bolt action, had a magazine for five rounds, fired smokeless powder, and that's what they used. In the, 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 part of the reason I included it was because the Wyoming National Guard used it in the Philippines during the Spanish-American War. Uh, but they were using Cuba and all over, so that's what this last gentleman here is. A, he's a, a Spanish-American War infantry, but uh, then your Indians, up, like I said, by 1876 and stuff, were pretty much fully armed with firearms, but they had anything from a cap and ball or a flintlock right up to uh, Winchester, you know, lever action, fast shooting, good quality rifles. Uh, it's part of a little bit of the reason Custer got wiped out. Uh, not the main reason, I mean, there's just too many Indians. But uh, they, the Indians certainly had a lot better weapons. And by some theories, his battle lines were broken by a bunch of men that were working together with Henry Carbines. And they kept the fire up so heavy on Custer's men that their men couldn't fight back and the Indians were able to break through their battle lines and start cutting them to pieces. So the cavalry also ended up with a 45 caliber revolver. That's what this is, Colts. Most of the weapons are Colt or Springfield. Uh, the gun that won the West, not along with the lever action Winchester. Uh, so those are the main weapons out here. Back here I have all the bullets displayed that they would have carried. Spear points for Native Americans. Uh, then by the time the four is here, they're going to steel points. Almost all the Indians were using steel. They could go into the fort at the sutler store and for a buffalo hide buy five steel points, you know, wrapped in wax paper. And take them home and tie them to the arrow shoot them back to the soldier the next day. <laughs> pretty, pretty good weapons. Uh, mountain man, here would be a powder measure for a mountain man, because they dump powder and then they would put the ball in, in the patch. The military at the same time, she used this type of rifles. Uh, this would be like a 69 caliber round paper cartridge. You have powder in the back, then you have a round ball and three small ones. So it's like called buck and ball. And when they're fighting in battle lines, you know, with a thousand guys in one square shooting a thousand guys in another square, this is what they're shooting. And really, you can't hardly miss with four balls flying out of your gun at 100, 100 feet or 150 feet, but they, they did. <laughs> the, the soldiers here at the fort, this is what their ammunition they initially looked like paper cartridges. Uh, you have powder in the back, you have the ball up front, you bite the bullet off in your mouth and hold it, you pour the powder down the barrel, and then you put a, I take it up, wouldn't be able to see it, maybe any, a percussion cap. Their pistol ammunition at this time for the military anyhow, and a lot of the Westerners came in a box like this, and they were paper cartridges. They had a little paper bag on the end of your bullet holding your powder, so they're real quick to load. Uh, your military ammo was distributed to soldier like this, 10 rounds in here. Two of the rounds would be called Williams Clean Out, which when you fired them, they were only half a regular mini ball. This is what they were shooting. It's a mini ball, it's hollow in the base. That was the big invention that allowed them to load the rifles much quicker. Uh, 
when the explosion went off and the gun went fired, it pushes the walls of this hollow space out into the rifling and rifles the bullet for you. So it spins when it comes out of the bore, goes straighter and further. Prior to that, it's when they're shoving the ball down a barrel with a cloth around it, you're rifling the ball then, and it's a much harder process. Uh, but then, with the Spencer, this is Spencer round. They were rim fire like modern day 22s. Pretty heavy. They came in four different calibers 48, uh, 50, 52, and 56. And the 48 caliber was for civilians. I'm not sure what the difference was or why. Uh, and then these are your Henry rifles, the first real repeating carbine that was out here. Two civilians had them in the uh, Federal fight and caused considerable damage. Most of the early Winchesters, surprising to me, are pistol ammunition. That's all they're shooting. They're not shooting like a 30 30 Winchester. That comes a little bit later. But in 73 and 76, when they first come out, they're shooting pistols like 38 caliber, 44, 40, 45 caliber. Some of them even smaller. Uh, your 5070, this is what 5070 looked like. It had an internal primer, uh, which was inside the bullet. Your, your firing pin went through the base of the bullet and hit that primer. Uh, a lot of the weight reasons we know where the corral at the wagon box fight is today is from our archaeology. These little internal primers after the bullet, after the round is fired, those become loose in here. And people went up and picked up all the shell casings, but those primers fell out. And that's what we found was a metal detector, so that could tell us where the corral was. Okay. Didn't hardly find any shell cases, but we found it all the primers. So that's a 5070. And then this is your 45, 55 or 45 uh, 70 for the Indian wars, the Custer wars and stuff. And then by the time of the Spanish American there down to pretty much what we look at as normal rifle ammunition. I have a question. Sure. Uh, whose idea was it to be so stingy with ammo when they're sending the troops into a hostile area? I don't know. We don't know if he wasn't bait. If there is some thought that the forts were put on the Bozeman Trail to lure the Indians away from the uh, railroad construction in the south. Because the railroads got to Cheyenne in 1866 when the forts are built. And the forts are abandoned and closed in 1868 when the railroads completed. But you'll not see that in writing anywhere, you know, unless you've got a tape recorder for the White House, maybe. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's uh, one of the thoughts about what was going on. But I don't know. They, you know, they sent him up here almost with the intention of him losing. You know, he, he was not a combat officer, although he was a brave man. He he kind of showed his troops up. But when Carrington first got here, uh, he was a commander of the 18th Infantry all the way through the Civil War. But he was primarily a staff officer. He never saw combat. But he put together units for the 18th Infantry and sent them to the field and ends up the Fetterman is the commander in the field. So he's fighting with those soldiers. And so when they both end up out here together, Fetterman's looking down his nose pretty hard at Carrington saying, well, you're, you're a coward, you don't have any, you know, guts. Because Carrington did not want to go take the offensive against the natives. But he was under orders to protect travelers on the Bozeman Trail, not to attack the Indians. And so that's what he was trying to do. And when the Fairman fight happened and all those men are killed out there, it was the first day, the day of the fight, they, when the relief party went out, they did bring back about half the bodies, but the other half were still out there. So the next day, Carrington asked for volunteers to go out and pick up the rest of the bodies. And all these big, brave soldiers who were back in Fetterman and all gung-ho and go fight the Indians, said, let the wolves have them. We don't want to, we don't want to go back out. The same thing that happened to us. 
And yet Carrington went out there and, and got the win back. So I thought that spoke volumes about him. But uh, why they left, sent him out here so poorly armed, poorly equipped, I have no idea why. About the only thing that does make sense in a way is that railroad. Anything else? So since uh, Forceville Carney lost uh, almost 80 men right there, a bunch, then they, they needed more soldiers. So the soldiers that came up to replace them then had the Ellen conversion, am I correct? No, they did not. They, they, did came, not. they got them the following summer. They got them the following summer. And it took them two to three months to get here. <clears throat> oh, jeez. Yeah. Forceville he, he, Phillips got there like, <coughs> Well, he got to Laramie on Christmas Day, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until February that they left and started up here. And then they, they brought almost all of the military's horses up here and died. During the December 6th fight, they have roughly 100 horses that go out in two different columns to try to have where's the Indians, so to speak. Well, on December 21st, two weeks later, they can only mount 27 horses. That's how poor their horses, because the horses were all Eastern horses and needed grain, and Carrington didn't have the grain, and he couldn't get it here. By the time you have a meal full of wagon, full of grain, he's eating all that grain by the time he gets here. You know, so it's a diminishing return. So but they finally did come up in the following summer. So well, I, they did. They did lose a lot of horses the same day or at the time that put them at um, um, French Pete was killed. The, the uh, troops that found French Pete were trailing uh, some Indians that had stolen quite a herd of horses. Yeah. yeah. So they lost the batch right. They lost that. their. They lost a lot of their livestock from the Indians for raiding them every chance they get. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a column up here in 65 called the Cole Walker column that went up around the Black Hills and they were up on the uh, Powder River in September. They lost 415 horses in one night on the picket line. <laughs> she just died, they dropped dead from cold, I guess. You don't know what. They were, the horses were so weak, in such a weakened state they couldn't ride them anymore, and the ones they had left, they led, they turned around and headed south. They had nobody with them that knew anything about the country. They had no scouts, no maps, no nothing. And they just headed south down the Powder River, and luckily a, a guy from another military column came across them, and he was able to lead them on at Fort Connor. Uh, did they ever trade for, like, the natives' um, ponies that were a hardy, you still yeah, much better for it. Yeah. Yeah, not that I know. The Indians wanted their horses too. They were big old thoroughbreds, you know, big horses. Uh, but, you know, it wouldn't take them while the, the, the thoroughbreds came around, you know, don't have that problem now out here. But at the time, no, they, everything the Indians had was something he even had, you know. They, they looked down their nose pretty hard at them. They didn't want to learn anything, you know, all the things they could have learned. They just had their nose in the air. Speaking of the horses and the size of the horses and everything, am, am I correct in that the military had a restriction on how big the cavalry soldier could be because they didn't pounds. want huge guys weighing down their horses? Yeah, John Wayne would not have been a cavalry. <laughs> yeah, even though some movies would say otherwise. Yeah, but 150 pounds is supposed to be the top weight for a cavalry. Did, did you? Yeah. So, I mean, they. If I remember correctly, in some histories I've read, um, there are how, I mean, some of their scouts were armed with lever action, but I, when did they ever actually put widespread um, lever action rifles in the military? No, no. Jeez. they were single shots, like I said, basically up until the 1890s, and then they went to bolt actions. Part of the reason of the lever action was what I mentioned about fire control; they, they couldn't control right. the fire. The other thing is the lever action has a real complicated action and they couldn't repair it in the field. Right. Whereas most of the muzzle lures and stuff they could repair in the field. So and even the breech lures were pretty easy to repair. So they stayed away from it.
Yes. Men were cheaper than equipment? Probably. In a way, yeah. I think part of, uh, one of the interesting things, too, is that the newer weaponry will get uh, issued to the band. Uh, just that's the way the logistics was so buggered up back then. And that's part of the, sometimes the am, wrong am, ammunition would go to the wrong post. It didn't have those weapons. So a lot of times I don't think it was purposely. I think it's just a lot of incompetence on the log side. On the logistics. Like the, band, the bands it seemed to get the, the newest weapons. And a lot of times the smart commanders would redistribute those. Well, that's what they ended up and doing here. because yeah. the band members knew how to fix their instruments. So maybe they knew how to fix <laughs> that could be, I hadn't thought of that part of it. The band, remember the band actually made the flagpole here. It was 140 feet tall. It was carved. It started out with uh, eight sides, and then it went to six sides, and then four sides, and then it, another pole, like a ship mast, was attached to it. And that did the reverse thing. And it was all, it was all painted black. It was pretty neatly designed flagpole. We're right now hoping to raise enough funds to maybe replace it. Yeah, I, I think it was probably the tallest structure in Wyoming, uh, probably up until 1960, 120 feet tall. So. You might mention about the galvanized Yankees a little bit too. That's an interesting part. Well, down at Reno, well, all the forts out here right at the end of the, well, during the Civil War, actually, a lot of the forts in the West were garrisoned by Confederate prisoners of war, which they called galvanized Yankees. Uh, there were two battles fought down at Fort Casper or Platbury Station. They were galvanized Yankees. Uh, Fort Reno, when he arrived there, Carrington to relieve it, was named Fort Connor at the time. He renamed it Reno, and he left a company of his regiment there to take over. The soldiers there were galvanized Yankees. They, the war had been over for a year, but they were still basically held at that at that fort until they were relieved. But they, you know, that if they'd been in a prison back east, they'd been released. But they were given soldiers, especially in the Western theater of the Civil War, the option of going to a prisoner of war camp, which in a way was kind of like a death sentence because of all the disease and starvation and stuff. They gave the choice of going to the prisoner war camp or going west and fighting Indians, where they would not fight other Confederate soldiers. And a lot of them took up on it. The artillery we had at this fort, when Carrington came north and goes to Fort Connor slash Reno, they had four pieces of artillery. Carrington didn't know how to use it. He didn't have any, all he had was infantrymen. But there was a colonel from the Confederate Army, an artillery officer. And he volunteered to come north with Carrington and come up here and he would trade some of Carrington's infantrymen into being an artilleryman. And that's how he ended up having the artillery. Uh, and his artillery, the first casualty of the Federal fight was from the cannon for that day, uh, shooting at some Indians down here in the trees. There's a story of him shooting the Indians up on saw the hill where the silhouettes are, and they were up there having a party one night, and uh, Mrs. Carrington couldn't get to sleep. So Henry went out and set a round off that exploded over the top of them and broke up the party. And uh, we went up with, and found remnants of them, of that kind of round explosion. You know. Would those Indians have experienced artillery prior to that? A little, maybe during the Sioux War in uh, Minnesota. In 62, they had a lot of artillery, a lot of mountain houses during that. Uh, but other than that, probably not. Yeah, Shirley must have been uh, very lucky to have somebody that knew how to shoot his little six pounder uh, in his battle because they were able to explode a shell over the uh, Indians that were going to charge them. They were, the Indians were called at the gun to shoot twice. Mm -hmm. They did not understand how it worked. Uh, it was almost, you know, magical to them. Uh, so they were scared of it. If the gun showed up, they, you know, they generally got out of there. And there is an, the Shirley fight, which happens east of Sheridan. There's some thought that they were trying to capture 
to the mountain house. I don't know if that's true. They did have a, a, a kind of a renegade. Uh, oh, it's one of the sons of the uh, fort down in Colorado. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, he was a white guy that was riding with the Indians. And they thought that they were trying to capture that gun. And would, if they had, they would pretty well make this fort pretty hard to defend because they had over at the start of the battle the wagon with all the ammunition and everything ran away from the wagon train and took it ran right into the Indians. So they got a wagon load of artillery ammunition right at the beginning of the battle. But they never yeah. could capture the gun. Glenn Swee, we did some research on that. Yeah. Um, speculated that the Indians were trying to capture that cannon so they could turn it on the fort. Yeah, yeah. Because they cut it, they, they cut it off. And the cannon was right at the end of the wagon train. And there were only a couple more wagons. It was wagon train was split up because of a real long <coughs> hill that they had to lower the wagons down. And they attacked when almost everybody was down here except for the cannon and a couple wagons. So yeah, there, there was a theory that that's what they were trying to do. It was. Uh, was that an eight pound or a six pounder you shot off at the wagon box fight demonstration? You shot no, it was 12 pounder. 12 pounder. 12 pounder. Yeah, that all was, the guns that was really 12 pounder. That was a contemporary round, too, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, that was what they would have used against yeah. natives. That was really impressive. That was, it was a shell, uh, Alistair's fire exploding ammunition in those days. And so you had the shell, which was a haul around with powder in it, and then you had the case, which was a haul around with several lead balls in it and a powder charge. And then you have canister, which is like big shotgun. How far do you suppose that was when the round exploded? Well, the, the range for a shell is uh, 1,020 yeah, yards. Yeah, that, that was a pretty long time. Well, it, 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 five seconds. Yeah, yeah. that's what the fuse was at. When you were demoing the paper cartridges, in the smoothbore, is it correct to say that there was no patch in smoothbore, but when they became ri rifled, then they patched the ball? No. They no. patched every They patched one. the rifles to begin with. Uh, even when they were flintlocks, if they were rifled, they would patch them. The smoothbore didn't make the patch. So the the only reason they, they, yeah, they just dropped the powder down and the ball on top of it, and they would sometimes take the paper or the patch that, that the rounds were in and put it in last to kind of pre hold everything down in there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then, like the mini ball, it didn't have a patch either. It was just round balls that had patches and, and rifle guns usually. If it was a smoothbore gun, they just dropped everything down the ground just rifling. And so, what, were they precision made enough to if you tipped them out, they didn't, they didn't roll out? You still had to. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not real sure about that. I do know they stuck paper in there in the days we shoot rocks out of their rifles. <laughs> <laughs> if it fit down the board, we would shoot out. I've been to a number of interpretive discussions like this as well at places like Gettysburg, where they were shooting round, uh, round balls out of smooth bore muskets. As they used that paper cartridge, tear it open, dump it the powder on the other end, they would keep the, pa the paper on the ball. Oh. Okay. Before going down in, that's what I've been told before. Well, that's help, help hold it in, too. Exactly, yeah. and then help create a little bit of a gas seal. I yeah. mean, they weren't that accurate with no. a 62 caliber smoothbore. Um, but well, I can yeah. hit that uh, a sign at 150 yards with that uh, smoothbore. Yeah, that's pretty good. Well, I don't know. It, it was pretty common, but. But that, well, that was the bucket ball, so I'm not really sure whether the, the ball was hit or right. one of the butts. <laughs> but something was hit. Maybe a rock flying up from the ground. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I I know from that, with a lot of the muskets, the parts were all kind of fairly loosely fit together to compensate for, like, the red smoke residue that often build up from from firing the gun repeatedly, so that would all that also had a lot to do with the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of stability in the firing mechanism. Yeah, and it's, 
on the smooth bore, it's actually more residue you built up in a way that probably is more accurate to gun gun. It's got a tighter fit. But it's also the reason they have the Allen clean out rounds for right. our rifle muskets because it, it was like a half a ball and a little tin plate, and that plate would unfold and scrape the residue out of the gun. And we used to think there were maybe two or three per 10 rounds. But we found a lot higher ratio of those on the battlefield than we did regular mini balls. So we're not real sure what the ratio was. What time is it? Uh, you're out. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Donovan Sprague, and I'm a mini Koju from the Lakota, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. My Lakota name is Chinkahu Wakanti, uh, which translates to high bath mode. And that's where the name of the humps came from, the father and son, uh, known as Chief Hump uh, and Crazy Horse. So those are my family, so uh, I can uh, people can research about guns and weaponry and and bullets and uh, soldiers and get their records and diaries of where they fought and what they were doing out here. But this was our home right here. And the two humps uh, were instrumental. Uh, the first hump, the father of hump, was a leader of the Fetterman fight on December 21st. 1866 and he also was a strategist leader at the August 1st wagon box fight the next fall 1867 just over here about five miles to the west so there was a lot of planning done for the August 1st and 2nd battles which were at Fort C.F. Smith and the next back-to-back uh, -to -back days here at Fort Phil Kearney. And that planning was done up on the Rosebud and up towards the Little Bighorn country, south of where the Battle of Little Bighorn was by. And that planning was uh, orchestrated. And so our family uh, went up and down through the Bozeman Trail and patrolled a lot of that area. And so uh, the things today, well, then the, the name Hump evolved from General Miles. So the son of Hump later became a scout under Miles. He surrendered at the Tongue River Cantonment, which is over at Miles City today. And uh, so it was through him that they, Miles asked them, well, what does Chinkahu Wakanti mean? And they said, well, a high backbone. They said, that's the hump on the buffalo, where he gets his strength and power and energy and delicacy, meat also. <laughs> so that's where my name comes from. It's not one that you just hand down by Chaske, firstborn or something. I had to earn that over several years. And I earned that. I'm the only uh, one with that name from the family and the tribe refers people to me. I, I hold all the, the family records on the humps and a lot of the crazy horse. Uh, and we're from the real family of crazy horse. So a lot of people don't like to say, well, there's a relative or whatever of crazy horse speaking. They always, you know, say I'm the great, great grandson of hump. But uh, they don't tie my relationship to crazy horse because uh, after Crazy Horse was was killed, people, his his widow remarried another man, took the name Crazy Horse. They're still using that name, and people today still claim, see, in the Indian way, relationship to him, and there's no blood at all. But but I'm I'm from the blood. The first hump was the uncle of Crazy Horse, and he raised him and taught him bow making. And so the weaponry I want to talk about today is, uh, you know, I thought it'd be a pretty interesting book if somebody wrote a book, uh, a native back then, about all the weaponry and, and what kind of bullets will work in this gun and which ones won't, <laughs> and which ones are going to 
maybe blow up in your face and stuff like that because they tried all of that altercation and the main thing they did was was cut the barrels down but see I'm going to go back to the to the bow making part with hump and uh, so imagine in the early days centuries ago having what was they developed what was called a uh, well first just a, a spear so you run down like a mastodon or something, a big buffalo, uh, with a team, a group of people. So that's where the buffalo jumps were important to maneuver that. And there was a picture somebody did of horses that are running over a buffalo jump. That's not real common because you can chase a buffalo down on horseback. But when you got a team of people on foot, we didn't always have the horse. So the horse is just like right in there with the weaponry. They were so adept at the horseback riding. I was just at the uh, Indian horse relays. You know, if you've ever seen some of that, uh, you know some of the horsemanship and the soldiers all noted that, that they were the best horsemen they had ever encountered. And they used like um, short bows in that. But first of all, just getting an animal down, you know, of a huge size for, okay, it's now uh, going on noon, so it's time we eat. Oh, there's the mastodon over there. <laughs> Very challenging. Uh, so then the atlatl came next. The atlatl was a, a device that, that could, uh, you could hold that and throw that, and that would project a spear point like. And so that greatly uh, helped and you didn't have to just be right there on the animal, like stabbing it. So that gave some distance. And then, uh, and then this is a lot of years all in between here. But then the bow and arrow uh, revolutionized things, you know. And then uh, for the horse, the horse arrived in uh, for us about the 1740s. So uh, that was a very important thing. You know, we had a prehistoric horse and all that, but the horse as we know it came up from the south in 1680s down in the southern United States, but then coming up here to this part, fanning out around the uh, 1740s. And that was also the recollection of the first uh, non-Indians, of the French also coincided with that. And we had a name for the horse. It was, uh, it was Shunka Waka. And uh, that, the Shunka is a dog. And the Waka is part of the Great Spirit name. Uh, Waka Tonka is God, is the Great Spirit. So they used the dog for uh, travel and you know carrying all the everything around transportation. You're walking, you know, from from Buffalo yesterday, and finally you walk up the story and all. And uh, so then the, the the horse then the Shuka Waka is God dog. So that's how they looked at that. You know, it was uh, it was the biggest dog they'd ever seen, <laughs> and uh, they became so adept on that. Like I heard Bob saying a little bit about uh, how they could maneuver, you know. And there's reports of uh, people like Crazy Horse even upside down on the horse, unclear underneath. He's he's dangling along, and all there was was sinew strap. Men didn't use saddles at all. The women had a, a form of a saddle with two like deer horns or elk horns on each side and then some rawhide attached across. But the man, you know, they could, they could dangle off the side and then uh, go in a circle on a small, fast pony and then they put their arm across the outer, the neck of the horse and then peek underneath and then reach back and, and release arrows underneath like that. So you were shielded by the horse's head. And, and it was something the soldiers had never seen. You know, they were probably so dizzy and confused and disoriented. And, uh, and that was the whole thing of, uh, of the way warfare was. So I brought a, a few things in. Uh, this one here has never been out. Uh, so these are some from my area here. These are, and I know there's some things around here too. But uh, these were, were from our camp area, and these are uh, spear points and knife 
a knife in there as well. And uh, this had a, a uh, it was kind of, at least when it was framed on the back, it had an old newspaper in there from 1889 in, in Nebraska. <laughs> and it's down by uh, Fort Robinson area is where these come from. So I have a little bit of uh, show and tell items here. And then uh, this one here, these are some points here as well, arrowheads from the our reservation in the Black Hills. And the middle is an is a awl, a buffalo bone awl. And of course you can date uh, bone. So this was uh, dendrochronology, the dating. This is 1,100 years old. It's on the, the Belfouche River. And uh, this being, this would have been really close to the Wyoming line, east of the town of Belfouche. And then, of course, the Belfouche comes clear over, you know, towards Buffalo and out that way as well. But some real fine flint napping going on there. So there was a, a real uh, evolving of, uh, you know, these people who were very adept at making uh, flint napping and bows and all that. And, and then with the trade item, with the, with the rifles and that, it kind of evolved to, uh, well, some of them just, the kids didn't really know the bow making. It wasn't being handed down. So already by the time of, uh, say like uh, after Little Bighorn and Wounded Knee time period, uh, th those were kind of almost getting to be lost arts among the, the people because they were surrendered on the reservation and agencies and they just didn't do that anymore. Uh, so the, uh, let's see, some other things I brought here. These are, uh, these are a hunting bow like here. So big, big long bows and the, the secret of the humps was was uh, they traded down on towards the Republican River area of uh, Osage Orange. So that's the wood that was used. And you didn't have to sinew back them. Bows would be sinew back from the animal itself. It looks like this. This is just decorative here. This looks like sinew. It is sinew. And they would melt that on there to strengthen it. So the, the Osage Orange were so strong, they didn't have to be back. And so another thing, they were always uh, true and ready to go. So don't anybody take a picture of me doing this because you're, you're not supposed to do this. It's not in the bow making book. <laughs> but with an Osage uh, Orange, I don't need to worry about, you know, uh, something happening to it. So anyway. That's a, a hunting type bow there. And uh, so, another bow that I brought out, uh, this is contemporary one I made made here. And uh, so I go to Oklahoma quite a bit and we have, I get my bows and wood down there. Here's another one. This one, uh, actually, first time I ever won a prize in Rapid City at the big uh, pop festival this uh, summer. I won an award at the Bell Fine Arts Museum for this, so this is a, an award. I can say it's an award-winning uh, bowl. Uh, so this is Osage Orange again, and then decorated with some uh, sinew uh, backing here. So I just brought that along. And so when you're scraping these, they also used, uh, sometimes we've found these like the elk horn. Anybody know what a draw knife is? Mm -hmm. So they used uh, like a draw knife of, made from uh, uh, antlers. And so you'll find those sometimes out on the prairie. People didn't know what they were, they were altered. And this was all deteriorated, but they would have sinew wrapped on that and then a, a flint blade and you, you pull this across to shave this. You pull that, that's your draw knife, you're making that. And then you count your rings here and you shave each one down like that through here. And so you don't want a, a bowl when it's cloudy and damp and cold to misfire, you know, or not fire at all, you know, give and take. 
dampness, coldness, but the Osage Orange were always ready to go. So when that elk is there, you know, majestic elk, you know, and you need that elk to take it at that time, or if that enemy tribal guy is right there in your face, it's <laughs> embarrassing if your bow's not working. So <laughs> you want a, a good working bow? The other things, I always throw in some surprises, and I did say I had a surprise for this. This here, uh, nobody uh, can take a picture of this or this. So I brought these along here, and I guess they don't look unlike what's around the museum here, but uh, they, I'm the caretaker of these here. And uh, these are from, all I can say about it is that these are from uh, a very famous battle. And these are from uh, other battles as well. These are uh, from the family. I'm going to uh, put some glue on that because that's the way it's been quite a while and just kind of, you know, fix, fix that part up. And I actually have some that were uh, flint, which is rare. Like uh, ones, flint ones from Battle of Little Bighorn even are super rare. There's not very many in existence. So I have this one here. And then also in, in my books, uh, I, I'm an author of 10 books. So some of my, um, my, a lot of my books then have pictures of, of historic photos. It's one of my books of, from the 1860s. Photography started for us. So this, these are full of, of weaponry and you know, pieces and what was made. And one of the pictures from my book is this picture here. I got two pictures here. This one you might see around this area. Uh, but this is my great-great-grandfather, Hump, right here with two of his five wives. These are Cheyenne sisters. This is 1879, three years after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. If you go up there to, to Little Bighorn Museum, look in the, the back where all the soldiers are on one side and the warriors who fought there are on the other side, and you'll see Hump right in the middle of them. But they cropped the ladies out, so they were surprised to see this picture because they didn't know there was the the complete picture, but it's cropped out like that. And I'll, uh, I'll save uh, questions for when I'm done here. And this skull cracker here was used in the battle of the Little Big Horn. And uh, I don't say too much about this stuff, but this skull cracker was buried with him. So we don't talk a lot about that stuff. We have graves that are secret and known only to family. But his, his grave has a marker. Uh, and so, they, and these are Cheyenne. Minikoju, Lakota, no picture of the first hump. It's in the winter count, drawings, calendars, his exploits. These are Cheyenne, there's my relative right up, right up there, Morning Star, Dullknife, the Cheyenne. That's where they're from. So they were very affected like by Sand Creek what happened there, and they followed that up with uh, uh, warfare at Julesburg, Colorado, cutting telegraph wires and on into the Platte Bridge at Casper and did all that fighting, and then the next step was up to Crazy Woman Creek. They did all that. They came to a uh, Fetterman fight. Uh, then, and this is chronological order, a wagon box fight and then they were also at the Battle of the Rosebud, and he was at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And they have his father huh, fighting at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, but he was not there. It was in all the winter counts. He died in 1870. So, but the historians don't pick that up. So, uh, it was his son who was 26 years old at that battle. So, this is one that hasn't been shown in there with a Winchester here. So he had a yellow boy. Uh, Winchester come out 1866. 
Um, and this is kind of a rare picture here of the son of Hump again. No picture of Crazy Horse, the famous Crazy Horse. I have no picture of the first Hump. Uh, the first Hump was six foot five, um, 300 pounds, physically fit, fought not only as a hitman uh, directing his, his warriors into position on the hills here, but also going right down into battle himself. And he did that at, at battles. They all noted that he, the heat of the moment in battle, you know, overcame him and he went down in there. But now, now his exploits and weaponry are recorded in General Miles' autobiography. So he, since he was with Miles, Miles became a friend of him after he surrendered and later he got a, a pension from Miles. He kept going to Washington and, and Hump, they joked at him. They said, well, he's expecting a pension. He's from the other side, you know, war. He, he can forget about that. But he ended up, he got that pension. And Miles was instrumental in getting that. But in things like, uh, he'll talk about their, their weaponry and stuff like that. Um, another thing, when they went to Washington later after the wars were over, everything changed, you know, so you don't see the weaponry, you see the peace pipe, they called it, but the, the pipe, you know, and things like that. So, Miles did talk about their uh, physical ability fighting, and he did talk about, you know, we, we made amends with this, but uh, Hump found the Nez purse when nobody could find the Nez Perce and Chief Joseph when he's on that loose that story. And Crazy Horse turned that down at Fort Robinson. He would be killed shortly after he put in the guardhouse. But Hump did go with Miles up there into the Bear Paw. And so Miles talked, in Miles' book, he said he was the greatest warrior and the strongest warrior that he ever knew of, of, of any American Indian. And he went down uh, and found the Nez Perce and all that. They came down the mountain and he grabbed the first uh, enemy and held him up like a bench press, you know, mm. over his head and then, you know, brought him down and the results were not good right over his knee. And so that, that was a lasting impact in General Miles's. And so a lot of the, the, the battle uh, here also, you know, despite being some of the best armed people by this time in some of the wars, this, these guns were coming out of the agency and these people would go back and forth from the agency out to the battle. Now our people were called the Hostiles, a band, a big band of Minikoju Lakota, Itaza Patrol Lakota, uh, Cheyenne, and a few Arapaho. But we were just like one with the, uh, with the Cheyenne because all of our men married Cheyenne women. Touch a cloud, I'm gonna show you a picture of him, known for his height. He also had uh, Cheyenne wives. The man who became known as Bigfoot, that's from our family, spotted out at Cheyenne wives, you know. And so we always see these books, you know, the Cheyenne are over here, and Dakota are here, and Minikos are maneuvering in here. They're all mixed. It's like one big family. And even when they put those camps in place on the Little Bighorn, you know, there was a lot of visiting and that back and forth, you know, and they they went back and forth. They weren't just just like that. So uh, here's a here's a modern arrow here. Uh, actually, this one is pretty old here, but you can see the uh, sinew wrapping and, and feathers on there and. Uh, a nice point there, and uh, this here is uh, a picture of uh, Touch the Cloud. This is one of, from one of my books. There's the picture, famous picture of him with a headdress, clear to the to the ground. Some people you've probably seen that maybe online, but his name is Touch the Cloud singular. So I've been in my lectures and I've been trying to get that across that it's singular touch the cloud it'd be like calling red clouds you know red cloud red clouds you know and uh, so I, I actually did a, a, a book review on a spotted tail book for Wyoming Historical 
and uh, just recent, I don't know if it's the last issue or the one before that, and they just automatically corrected that, thought it was a typo, and put an S on there. Uh, <laughs> now I'm going backwards. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, he's got a, a, a Remington. Uh, it says on here he's Crazy Horse's bodyguard. They're first cousins, the son of Hump and Hutch of Cloud, Bigfoot, Crazy Horse, on that level, all first cousins. And he's got a, a Colt revolver and a Remington, and so I have the Remington um, explained in my book, you know, the, the year and more, more information. But he was known for his height as he grew. He was, he was about uh, 6'10", but they usually record him as uh, seven foot, so as he grew, you know, touched the cloud. And then his son, uh, Amos Charging First, was in our, our community. He was 5'9", he was his son. And then the next generation, boom, backed up. So we say every other generation, good basketball players. <laughs> and, uh, so some were down at Kansas, and my nephews, some were up to seven foot two. Uh, six, ten, seven foot, seven foot two, and that's where all this comes from. That other headdress is over Cody, and so um, people back in the day, they they would put that on the uh, average size man, and it, it drags, you know, behind like a little nightgown or something. But when, when he stands, it's not even touching the, the ground, you know. So a uh, bodyguard, a crazy horse, he was with crazy horse when they tried to put Crazy Horse in the guardhouse on September 5th, 1877. And uh, so uh, they were gonna put him in the guardhouse and Hutch a Cloud said he's too honorable a man to go in there. And so they honored his wish to put him in uh, kind of an adjutant's office and that's where he died in there. But there is, you know, stuff about him uh, sit, he was by Crazy Horse's body all all night until he he died. The parents came and they got him on a travoy, and they took him out of there. So I have a book, a 700-page book that's hoped to be published this year. Uh, it's been done for uh, five years. It's called Hump and Crazy Horse: The Lakota Cheyenne History from a Family View. So this is one of our uh, earliest family people here, George Catlin sketched. And so that's the way we learn about the way things are, you know, like uh, weapons and bows and arrows and, you know, just, just like that. And so there was no photography then. <coughs> this guy, he's famous in South Dakota history. So he would be well known over there. He tried to take the, the keel boat from Lewis and Clark and about set off a uh, war, uneasy tensions, and they pushed off from the Missouri River. Lewis and Clark went on up just north to the Mandan village, and that's where they got uh, Sacagawea as a guide and, and went on. But I've uh, done research just like on a picture like this, you know. He wraps his hair, his hair came clear to the ground. Mm -hmm. Some of our elders, back when I first did my book, they said, we didn't wear our hair like that, so that was the first. But they did, Catlin was very meticulous. He drew, and he kept a journal. In his journal, he said, uh, I'm gonna paint one horn first because he's the head leader of Minikoju Division and can run down a buffalo on foot. And so uh, at Fort Pier on the west bank side there, he, there was a herd of buffalo and he took off on foot just kind of trotted in there and got in the middle of that herd. That herd took off with him right in the middle until he got the biggest bull there and he pulled out his bow and arrow and drove that arrow right into the heart of the buffalo. So that was pretty impressive for, uh, for George Catlin. So you've probably seen a lot of books on George Catlin. He drew tribes all over the U.S. And then I should have mentioned the one of Hump is L.A. Huffman, the famous uh, Mo Montana photographer from Miles City. And uh, Edward Curtis also did quite a few stuff you know, with us. So I'll pull out a few more uh, things that are down here. Maybe I could have uh, somebody 
owe this for me? Would you owe that for me? Uh, down here in the bottom of the pile. There's some of my other books that this is like Sitting Bull's uh, Tribe here, Standing Rock. This is my home county. Actually, that's touched the cloud right there, seated. Looks like he's a head taller than everybody else. And a modern uh, Standing Rock book there. And uh, Pine Ridge Reservations, one of the Lakota. There's a, a American horse. Man afraid of a source. Rosebud is one of the, of the Lakota. There are seven bands of Lakota. Ogallala at Pine Ridge, Sichangu at Rosebud, Lower Grove, Umpapa at Standing Rock, and the other four are at my reservation. They're on the flag. I'm a Minikoju, Itazipcho, Sihasapa, Uhweanupa. So those seven Lakota words are the, what comprises uh, the Lakota. So French have confused that, like called the Sichangu is burnt thigh, their legs are burned in a prairie fire, some of the members, so French call them brulee, but uh, Sichangu is a burnt thigh. Uh, let's see. So this here, yeah, I brought this here too. Here's a, this is a sledgehammer. So, you put sinew over this, there's a chip down through there. This is an old one, this isn't nothing modern. <coughs> and then, uh, I had even had a bigger one, but it was bogging my cart down, so I got the next <laughs> smaller one. So a sinew and then a, a large, heavy stick on here, and it's just like a sledgehammer. So when I get that uh, boat art piece, I've got a, a round piece staved and then you you hit that right over the middle of it and split that. And then you just let your wood go however, you know, fight it. And then you'll split that again. So I get four staves or bows out of out of one there. And of course smaller ones for, for grinding and, and that sort of thing. And then this here is a trade item, and I actually made this too, but uh, the traders knew the native people like, you know, tobacco, and then of course the tomahawks, so they improvised, and there's another one here, where you could have both of these on one. So this is more uh, decorative, you know, if you throw it, then that wouldn't be good on this gold part. And, but it's, it's got good, good leverage, and it could be, uh, be functional as well for throwing. So. I said, fight first and then afterwards sit down and have a smoke afterwards. Tobacco <laughs> goes right in there and this has a hole down, down through here. Tobacco was ceremonial too, you know, I don't want to get any bad habits started today to encourage you, but uh, tobacco was very uh, important. By the way, where was tobacco growing out here? Well, the... Uh, uh, a Rickera had a lot of the really good tobacco. They called it a, a re, that's another name for a Rickera, a re. Called it re-twist tobacco. And they grew that, and tribes all over the plains traded for that. That was the favorite kind. So when we got re-twist tobacco, you could uh, alter that as well. You could put your own ingredient into that and mix. So, so people uh, mix that. Uh, and then just a couple other things here I brought. Let's see. Just about done here. Some little stuff here that I made. This is a buffalo horn soup ladle uh, for dipping in. And you can see I haven't missed too many meals. <laughs> so a big spoon. Buffalo horn. Every piece of the buffalo was used for something. And then, of course, the tanning process. I tan hides. There's a rawhide, and it has leather in its natural form. When it's tanned, it's uh, buckskin, like this, softened. Um, and this one is a sculptor here. It's got the ridge uh, here across, across it. 
an old one. And then this one is contemporary, is made with a deer handle and stone. And it kind of fits a handle there. Uh, one or two more things here. So I want to mention with the, the whole hide tanning process. So I, I'll tan a hide and you decide if you want hair left on it or not. Buffalo robes would be valuable just the way they are with hair on it. You wouldn't want to take that off. Too valuable for, you know, carpeting and all that. And that's uh, TP lodges and stuff. They take that off. But, um, so anyway, we, we scraped the hide, and this is all the women's job, so the ladies should really be alert on this part and aware of this, because that was a woman's job, was man. So get that uh, hide up there, soak it overnight in the stream, and weight it down with those rocks, because uh, the hides float, you know. Even the man dad used some of those for boats, little, little, like, brown boats and then uh, put that up you know on the ground or spread it out and then you want to scrape the side if you want the, the buck skin with the hair off we take scrape the hair off the epidermis side we take that uh, down and soak that and then they put it back up with uh, a brain tanning solution and they always said that one uh, animal's brain would tan itself if it's a Squirrel, that size is just the bright, and then the buffalo brain is just as much. So I mean, just the right amount. Put one cup of water with that, and then boil it. Bring it, just heat it up to a boil, and that's what you paint on. That nobody knows why. Just it breaks the fiber down, and then after that process, it's soaked, and then you go into the final processes kind of working or kneading that over something like I use a wire or some tie wire but um, you then that's when it starts fluffing out and all that and then like two two deer hides for a man's shirt and then stitch down through here sewed together and then the quill work porcupine quill work like this is original uh, decorative um, before beads so there were no beads. Beads came from Europe, and these quills were dyed. So you put that on there, and, and then the leggings and all that. Fringes are always important, even bigger than that. More fringes, more fringes. Got to have fringes on everything. As a horse is going, you know, that mane and that tail and that show, and that headdress is going, and, you know, uh, looking good. A lot of part of... Uh, of uh, the horse capture, which evolved, was basically horse stealing among tribes, and warfare was looking good. Some of these battles, they just ended it. It's like soldiers, well, they could have wiped us out totally, but they chose not to. When, when they were done, they were done. They went back, maybe it's lunchtime or something, you know, we're going to take a break. Uh, so then the, the hair on, too. Let's see other things I was going to say about that. But, you know, all the products from leather and the women's dresses were so soft like that. And then decked there with quill work, bead work, yokes for the women of, uh, of elk teeth. And there's only two molars per elk, so a lot of elk, you know, decorated, decorated those. And uh, uh, cowrie shells on the top for women and the... Uh, the elk bone for the women go this way, up and down, and ours go this way. you notice that, you know, the women's are all down. So some of those are really heavy too, the ladies are on that. If that hide gets wet, then that's not good either, because ladies start drooping, you know, walking so heavy. <laughs> and you can somewhat waterproof uh, your hide by holding it over smoke of a fire. So that's why those vests, some of the vests look kind of yellowed. Then that smoke's on there, put some hickory smoke in there, little fragrance, you know. Oh, it's that guy in there today. <laughs> Ladies are really doing a double take, you know, following them around. And then, then too, with that hair, if you left the hair on your, 
you're dancing with your lady or whatever, and a real embarrassing thing could be um, your eye start, they call it slipping, if you didn't pan it right. So that's trial and error. You learn. You may have soaked that too long and didn't do you know next time because that, that lady didn't like that. You know, she danced with you and she pulled her hand up and here's a handful of hair. This guy's not cool. <laughs> he don't know tan you know, very well. But anyway, that was ladies level, the ladies job. But I showed you that 1,100 year old uh, um, hall. And so like with drills, I've got a flute in there too. This is uh, a drill, the various types of drill for uh, putting, you know, drill holes and that. Here's another, another drill here. Put a, a wood T on the top with sinew again, as wrapped up, like figure eight, put on there. And then here's an arrowhead from our family. Um, so all of those were were some of the essential things that that were used, and it seemed like there was one more thing I'm trying to think of here. Um, well, show you one of the only thing I don't didn't show here. And there is a a flute in there, so I might as well show that. I'll show it. There's a, a hump, both and crazy horse had flutes as well. That, that were recorded. So everything had a story too, and so um, the way the flute came, a man wanted to meet this lady who didn't know he existed. Every time he said hi, she said bye. And so uh, he went into the woods to get an a elk. From the elk, there's a gland you slip, and that's like a, a musk aftershave, and he's going to put that on and, and uh, increase his chances of being noticed for uh, so anyway, the elk wore him out in the woods, and he rested, and uh, he heard the sound. He came, came awake, and he heard the sound like a drone. And he followed over to that tree. It was an aromatic cedar tree. So all of my wood is aromatic cedar for that. And uh, as he got over there, there was a, a woodpecker kept coming back and forth from that tree, like he's something over there, he's wanting him to see, taking him back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he got over there, and uh, here's a branch all hollowed and warm, weathered, and wind switched and blew down through there. That's what the, where the sound was coming. And so the man uh, looked up there, and the uh, woodpecker was up there. Woodpecker come out to investigate and stepped on these holes with his foot and that changed the notes down. So he walked back and it reversed the notes. And uh, so the man took that down, the branch, in its rough form, took it back, and that was the very first flute ever, the story of the first Lakota flute, how it came to our people. He learned to play the flute, and then that lady, now she got all in this. So she likes that sound and the, the song. And what everybody remembered was that they were married shortly after. So ever since then, the, the flute is associated with courting and love. And so I've made, uh, I just had these in that uh, that show also have a word many flutes. And my numbers just went over 700. Mm -hmm. Each one is numbered. So I've made over 700 of these uh, flutes. Mm -hmm. um, they're all hanging up on my wall. I'll tell you some notes on it.
they had a drum flute and a rattle since anybody could remember. So anyway, that's how the, the food came. There's stories with with everything like that that explain the lies. And so the uh, wise men and women always had these stories that they told people, you know. And uh, so that, that was a good part of the storytelling. And oral history was done on heights. The most important event of the year was drawn on a height. I'll just cover one quick era. I've got one of the uh, winter counts. So since we're right here, and it is also in this book, 1860, there's a picture right there of the ridge in, in that book. But um, so um, the first one, 1865, we'll go to that one. Many horses died off. So what's drawn is uh, it's a tree branch, and it's all heavily laden, like with snow. It's weighted. That's all there is on there. And 1866, there's a uh, soldier with the saber. It says 100 white men died. That's the Fetterman fight. The most important year for 1867 was they surrounded the white tents. That's uh, the wagon box fight. 1868, they traded many mules. There's a couple mules in the drawing. That's the Fort Laramie Treaty. And then in 1869, an old woman was killed by a tree. And uh, I think I'm about the only one that has pieced that together. It's in my new book, uh, what that event is. And it's actually, it actually happened at Sheridan. It's a, it's a battle between Lakota and Crow. And they were actually right in our, our camp at one point. And then uh, 70, the most important event for 1870, it's a man standing, and there's a round bullet traveling, and Hump was killed. The, the father, the, the father of Hump was killed over the mountains here by the Shoshone. Well documented fight in the Crazy Horse books. Uh, Crazy Horse said it's not a good day to go in. It's rainy, slippery, hump and sick, what they did. But um, they they camp right in this area. They, when they came down on the, halfway up on the Big Horns, from Big Horn down to Story, they came in on, on this part of it. And then the women at the wagon box over here, you could see it right out here, stood on that knoll over there and watched the battle and they cheered them and so if you go to the wagon box site just right over here which i would highly recommend read those little podiums in the circle right there and that's all in there they have it so they know that and, and of course uh over here this battle had three main fights of fetterman and uh, decoys led them out crazy uh, hump chose crazy horse as a leader of the decoys and uh, that's where reports of him hanging off the horse and dangling and sometimes he even falls off the ground and like he's up limping and wounded or he's jumps over on his horse and and it's like the soldiers are just oh, a little bit further and we got this guy they don't realize the bigger picture they have to wait patiently for all the, the cavalry and the infantry too was a waiting time to get in there and then they close the trap on them but uh, that quickly went to uh, to hand a lot of hand to hand, uh, as did a uh, little big one. A lot of that towards the end. Uh, pump was the son of pump was was uh, shot off his horse on Calhoun Hill, and that's really a turning point when Hump and Crazy Horse split the soldiers in half, and it was all disoriented then. And then from from uh, from Calhoun Hill over to the last stand hill, you see all those white markers all over the soldiers. A lot of them were off their horses because the, the warriors always go for the horses. That's really more important than, than the battle. Wow, I don't want that horse. And so a lot of them were dismounted and just running and kind of panic. And the way some of the warriors described it too in their accounts was that they they <coughs> broke them off into smaller groups. It was like the way we hunt buffalo. We take them off into smaller groups. 
So that was explained quite a bit, you know, like that. Of course, Walter Camp interviewed my great-great-grandfather about the battle. Uh, you might have heard of the man White Bull. He was a nephew of uh, City Bull. One Bull and White Bull were brothers and nephews of City Bull. Uh, one White Bull had a book, you know, and uh, Warpath, and, you know, he wrote a lot about this, the battles here. The little bighorn, and then where did he settle at the reservation? He came back, settled in at Cherry Creek, our home, and right next to Hump. <laughs> so over at the when when they're talking about the Fetterman, they said, why why did White Bull not say so much about about Hump? You know, even though others did, Ogallala and being leadership and all that. Well, that's it's like a protocol thing. He was kind of like, you know, in Hollywood almost, but he had to come home at some point and live, and he's not going to tell a hump story. That's kind of the way it is, you know. You're respective of their own family story. So my family story would be uh, one of the first of, of, of family history, you know, rather than I review a lot of books where, well, Little Big Man or Little Big Horn, somebody from, author from New York City is, wrote a new best-selling book that have ever been out here. But anyway, that's the book we get, you know. But what about, what about our story, you know? So I'm pleased that you're here today and I uh, feel you know, honored to share some of this information with you, including the, this bow here. Uh, very few white people have ever seen that. So anyway, I brought this for the people here today. To, to bring that and that one that one arrow out. It, it stays at home and it had to have ceremony before it comes over here with uh, uh, the sage. The kids, if you see that uh, shiny silver, that's our ceremonial sage. And it smells really good. That's a purification. And you don't want to pull it up by the root, but you can take off a little bit of the top and then they they burn that for purification. And our, our people believe that uh, it's all the negative things out away from things. So we have to honor those. Even uh, a bow case, which I've seen one in here, is more like the ones I make, yeah, more like that. But people at the museums, they said, well, uh, the dream catchers, I thought they were on the cradle horses. When you see them on cradle horses, the filter out, you know. Lives. But we also see them on the, on the boat, the cases, so what's the deal there? So it's the same thing. You know, your, your weaponry had to be have ceremony too before you went into battle. So much of the people's day was ceremony. It was very religious people. They, they prayed to the, to the Orion Star. You know, and then from then on, it was like probably a prayer for the buffalo we're going to take today. If we're successful, there's another prayer of thankness for that. And uh, a big part of the, of the life was, was ceremony, not just warfare. And then on the military side, I've been all over the world, uh, Germany and France, and I spoke at a lot of bases, Fort Knox, and uh, the DOD, and Defense, logistics defense, it's called now, and with Battle Creek, Michigan. And uh, I show these stats, you know, numbers. Ira Hayes raised a flag at Iwo Jima. I have a, a Chickasaw astronaut, NASA astronaut, his astronaut suit, John Harrington, Chickasaw. And then here's this, the number that I always present at that. 50% of American Indians are veterans of U.S. wars, and no ethnic group in America comes anywhere close to that 50% participation. Well, once in a while, like after I left Fort Knox, that was quite a while ago, CNN, his numbers were coming across on my presentation. I thought, well, that's cool. They're getting the news, the message. Well, something happened, and I'm not taken political sides or anything, but something happened just a minute, uh, a month ago. In a, in a speech, uh, 
somewhere. Here the president is, and 50% of American Indians are veterans of U.S. wars. So they did check all that research. No ethnic group in America comes anywhere close. I thought, that's me talking. That's my life. So it's good, you know, the story, you know, comes out. And we have a lot of great stories from all these these battles. And uh, the next place I'm going to be is down at the, the uh, Oregon, California Trails National Convention down in Casper. I'm going to be leading some tours down over to the old Fort Reno and then into Crazy Woman Creek and then up here to Fetterman and Wagon Box and then being on a panel down in, in Casper. That's a big national event at the end of, of this month. So uh, I want to thank you again. Our Bilami uh, is our thank you word. So Bilami. Uh, <laughs> Questions do if you have any. Yes. Um, I I heard a story of um, I wish I could remember his name, but it, he was the last war chief, and it was during World War II that he completed the tasks, and one of them was to steal the horse of of the enemy. Is there? Do um, you know that story by chance? I I've heard different <coughs> tribes have had stories of challenge like that. But I don't, I don't know the individual. Oh, okay. It was Joe. Yeah, he told that when he was probably 100 years old. Mm -hmm. He was honored at, at uh, Washington, and uh, he is a friend of mine. We were at some of the Little Bighorn anniversaries together. We spoke up there, and uh, some friends of mine have pictures out here. Joe took them out. He used to share them to some of the sites over there. You know, it's a uh, battle site between Cheyenne and Absolute uh, Crow and Sundance site. Uh, yeah, very, very great, honorable man. Yes, Joe said there was a you know, bluff out there. He used to share them. It was called the Sioux Garden. But you didn't know why it was called that. The Sioux Garden? Yeah. Well, it was very much uh, Sioux territory, I mean, Lakota territory. And uh, so a lot of this whole business of, of uh, pro territory, we were, we were in control of that. People don't realize how large the Sioux were by population. We had activity in the Dakotas. And meanwhile, out here, they called them our family, the hostiles, a whole a large contingent. Our people were on the, from Miles City to Dayton. That was the main beat there on the Tongue. And then down patrolling the Bozeman Trail, which sometimes led us, led them clear down into uh, Julesburg area, you know, and on up through there. So an incredible range when you think about uh, the horses and all that. For sure, on your uh, horse with bow, uh, that would be a little bit difficult to obtain. You'd have to yeah, you can. They don't grow here. No. So, is there a significance with the term medicine bottle? Is there a way to look at the bow? I, I heard there was one that was bone. Big one. Yeah. 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 Now people had different uh, different bows. You could identify those same way with uh, flutes and and then even family colors. Our our uh, feather was a red tail hawk of crazy horse. So we never we never wore a bonnet. It's like one or two eagle feathers, humble eagle. And, uh, so that's all you see. There there's a winter count, a couple of them in the year. Um, how visited Washington? Surprisingly, he never did learn English. They got a red tail hawk in the show. What are the right on the Going on stuff here. The people find these flat uh, things they call them a large plate in the a circular piece of wood or stone. 
small pancake. Eskimos use a similar uh, stone called a ulu. Oh yeah. As a knife. knife. Yeah. Ulu. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's kind of rounded. Yeah. yeah. Scraping too. Mm -hmm. But then some were uh, for grinding too. The stones like those pestles they call them the uh, pate and mano, the Hispanic words. And then over here in in sight is a buffalo jump. Yeah. Uh, the lake over here, Lake the Smith on the north side, that was uh, a ceremonial area for Sundance. You know, the big camp over there. And that's where um, Hump got his bear lodge, uh, his bear medicine. And they kept in touch with Bear Lodge or with uh, the Bear Lodge, it's called Devil's Tower. But they had a ceremony there. And uh, I was told some of the other tribes were kind of superstitious about that lake area, but we weren't. And also right in this area, another hideout camp of ours is, is the over a, a hole in the wall and the dough knife and all that. So now I have stuff in my book, all documentation, uh, many koju were over there, the Tazit show were all in the dull knife fight. Hump was in the dull knife fight. It's not it's not reported nowhere in, in history. Because that's that uh, dull knife to these girls, you know, that connection. But they couldn't ever find that camp. It was one of the most secluded back in there were Graves ranches. And so uh, some of the Cheyenne squealed on them over that crazy one, and they told them, they said, they're camped over there in the winter. So in November, that's when they went looking for them. And I, I was told that day when they went in there, the, there was an inversion or something that kept all the smoke right over that camp area. So that pinpointed right where they're at, and they went in, and thus the dull knife fight was called. But books would say it's Cheyenne only, you know, it's a Cheyenne deal. You know, it's it's a Dalmain story. And books would say the whole Bozeman Trail and most of all this is Red Cloud's War, Red Cloud Bay, everything. You know, it's too big of a territory for one man to be in control and then, you know, of all of this operations. And I want to say in eighteen sixty eight that after the forts were burned here, C.F. Smith and uh, Fetterman, I mean, Fort Bill Kearney and, and Reno, the, the people then went in and the treaty was signed in 1868. You know, Red Cloud went in and had Red Cloud Agency named for him. Uh, you won't find Crazy Horse and Hump named anywhere on that treaty. By not signing the 68 treaty, Hump had 13 more years of freedom. He went to Canada with, with Sitting Bull. And when he surrendered up there, look at the, I think they have it here, the Sitting Bull Surrender Census is a great book by Ephraim Dixon. They surrender, and Hump has by far the largest band up there in Canada. 714 people is in his band, men, women, and child, and recorded in their coded names in, in that book. And uh, so, with that, uh, the, the wars were over uh, right after, a year after Little Bighorn. And April and May, our family surrendered, and they, they didn't want these five together ever again, the military. They surrendered over by Otter Creek off the tongue, and Crazy Horse went to uh, Red Cloud Agency to Fort Robinson, was killed three months later touched the cloud, went to Spotted Tail Agency. He's many calls you. And later, he'll get permission from the agent because he's with the Sichangu to return home to Cherry Creek. Many calls you. Dull Knife goes to Oklahoma, to Indian Territory. He'll run away from there. There's that story. And Hump surrendered to Miles at the Tongue River Cantonment right there. And the fifth one was Lane Deer from our family. He was killed south of Lane here. 
name for him. And uh, the lame deers today from our family are like my uncle uh, flying by, Wilbur flying by, his head of the studies, and Joe flying by from Standing Rock was a famous medicine man, kind of modern medicine man. But there's two flying by, it's two BYE and it's BY. But they come from that, that lame deer family, that some of the sons that went east. Yes. Uh, the medicine wheels up here now, are they still part of the culture now, or is that? Yeah, I, I, oh I, yeah. I, I've read some of this, it's uh, almost prehistoric kind of, to go way, way back. Yeah, there are, it goes way back to a lot of different cultures and people that use that, trying to figure out this. Different people that use the same? Uh, different ways, different people, I'd say. Some may have used it as a calendar. There's 28 spokes, you know, in, in other areas. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of about as far west as we as we would typically go. You know, the first hump way out of this territory in that battle with the Shoshone, and then right right through here was like the the heyday time period. Now, in the 18 uh, 50s is when our whole contingent got in here to Tongue River to keep the crow up here. We had to be right here at their doorstep because they go into the Black Hills. Okay, winter count of 1850, uh, crow in the Black Hills, and they killed one of Hump's relatives, and they took one of the women, you know, and back and mix one. We go up, we do the same thing, and we kind of another day at the office. <laughs> but we really did keep that pressure on them up here to, to control all the Powder River, Powder River Basin, and pretty much everything this side of the Bighorns clear down, you know, to Casper area, and then the more of the Ogallalas and the Sichangu pick up with uh, Nebraska Territory, down to Kansas, Republican River area, and we have our Dakota in, in Minnesota, large numbers over there, and that story is another story. There's Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, the three, three different dialects. So very, very large nation. Once the five surrenders happened, it was over. So the five reservations are established in South Dakota. Pine Ridge, Rosebud, Standing Rock, Cheyenne River, Lower Rule, and a wagon could come one. A single family, non-Indian wagon could come through. You never see a native person by that time. They're all surrendered. So in the generations before me, they told about the, the Fetterman, oral history, Little Big Horn, there's this mountain over here, Medicine Wheel. All we had was stories. And now I, I feel so fortunate in my lifetime that, that I, I live here part-time most of the time and I'm connected to these spots. So that I spend a lot of time out, out in the field when I'm driving by, you know, it feels good to look over. I know so-and-so's buried over there and this happened over there. and all this stuff it gives you power and strength right here in your heart and when you know your history where you come from that's that's important it, it gives you strength you can walk and so I come from the poorest reservation in America Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe poorest town in America highest unemployment rate lowest per capita income I was speaking at the pen one time, and the entry, and all the natives were in there. These kids, I thought, wow, this looks like a high school graduate assembly. These kids, 60% of the pen was native Lakota. And then they just clung to me like, you know, I have all this family history. I'm like, who is my relatives? And they didn't, this line, they just engulfed me. They wouldn't hardly let me leave and so the next year I asked the counselor I said well, what what should I talk about this year and she said Donovan they want the very same thing because they never got any of this they don't know who maybe who their father was or no parents and stuff like that 
So they never got that history to be, to keep those strong values, bravery, generosity, respect, and wisdom. So I, I did that, and I noticed there was this one guy really sullen in the back, kind of looking like he knew it all, older guy. And then finally at the end with questions, he said, uh, he said, that, that's really good. He said, you know all that stuff, but he said, the difference between us and you is that you had all this handed to you by your family. It's all handed now, see, and we never got that. So they never, they never knew this story. So I unfolded this, this little story chapter of my life. So I told him, I said, well, you know, I was born and raised on the reservation, lived there all my life. But it's kind of ironic because usually, well, what happened was my parents gave me away. I raised myself. See, I didn't have no parents. And I learned all that history from the elders and grandparents. And my dad went to uh, San Diego and my mother went to uh, to Salt Lake, and so I, I did, different families had me, they passed me around to one, one uh, family. Well, the fire chief had this story, he said, well, he said, I was there when the, your trailer house got on fire, and we rescued you and your brother, and we pulled you out of the, the bedroom window just before the whole trailer burned up, and the parents are gone. And the only thing that survived, I have a, an artifact, <laughs> It's classified an artifact. Now it's uh, one of my shoes. <laughs> <I'm an artifact. laughs> one of my baby shoes was in the neighbor's yard. And was found. It's the only thing that survived that that fire. So when I told that guy that story, how that came to be, then all oh, right, um, you're one of us. <laughs> he accepted me, gave me a big hug. <laughs> he said, "Keep our history. You're doing good." Yes. We're very fortunate that you're doing all of this, and uh, you should be congratulated for putting this stuff together. Let's give you an example of how little people understand what's going on. Uh, I took some people from England uh, on a tour here and went up to the Rosebud, and I announced that we were going to go into the Cheyenne Reservation. And uh, as we crossed the line, I said, we're in the reservation now, and this lady looked around, and I don't know what she expected to see. She says, uh, Keepies. Well, how do you how do you keep them on the reservation? Yeah. And I said, well, we don't. She says, do you mean you let them in your towns? Yeah. yeah. There's I a said, lot of the basketball players in Rochester. <laughs> yeah. A lot of education. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a couple more yeah. questions. One thing I was wondering if that is an authentic headdress with the animal forms. I've yeah. never seen one like that. I've yeah, seen they Buffalo use and they use those. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And then I live uh, down around Claremont, oh, yeah. down okay. east of here. And uh, I found a really nice arrowhead. I know it was authentic, but do you know of any way you could tell me what tribe that was from? If I had a photo of it or showed oh, it to you? Oh, uh, possibly. A lot of times I just use those arrowhead books in different cultures. Oh, I, okay. My uh, brother-in-law, I got a whole bunch of arrowheads I brought down mm -hmm. from. Uh, Red River down in uh, Texas, Oklahoma. He's got a lot of them down there, and so that's how we kind of made those into Caddo. People said, oh, oh they're uh, Chickasaw or Cherokee, and I said, I know. Well, it's got to be one of the tribes around yeah, those here. Yeah, what they call uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole. You know, they're southeastern tribes, so right. they moved in the 1830s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'd like to kind of know more about it, really. Yeah. yeah. Not sure. So. I, I find some flakings up on these hills sometimes. They're scouting. Yeah, I places. found a lot of like chipping. There, there's some good scouting points up here, halfway up the mountain above Story and Bighorn, where it's mm -hmm. lots of scouting. Like I told this group, uh, our family could go up halfway and have a commanding view of this whole area. You can see trucks on the interstate coming in, and uh -huh. right where they go. You don't have to go up very far. And then we had others. Uh, some of the old lawless came in over here on the east to the Fetterman and that. But they had a commanding view you know, mm -hmm. of all that. And then with with like Platte Bridge too, that um, that came up. I'll be going down there. They organized a lot of that over at that domain. Hole in the wall area, but, right, right. and that on the way down, 
there's people like George Bent, you know, in his mm -hmm. writings. Yeah, yeah. He's with the Cheyenne, you know, and he reported these, this large number, about 700 people heading towards Casper. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hub picked out about, uh, about, s about six of the, um, the decoy people again, including Crazy Horse. Then when they met the uh, some of the Oglala and Si Chandu coming in from the east, they picked more uh, mm -hmm. of the decoys. But down there, same thing. Now, if you read the story of Pratt and Platte Bridge fight, uh, that's where Casper Collins was killed, the uh, uh, namesake for mm -hmm. Casper. But the first um, recollection is those 10 scouts. Oh, you see them on the north. Sense and they start trying to lure him out right there, and then more of them come in. Uh -huh. And then, of course, with Collins, his, his horse shied and took him right into the enemy. Heck of a thing. Terribly mm -hmm. embarrassing. Very, yeah. <laughs> and then there are stories, too. Uh, you will find uh, in the Crazy Horse by Sam knows that Crazy Horse and Casper Collins were boyhood friends, and then he sees them killed at the fight and crazy horse like oh my god my boyhood friend fiction <laughs> fiction never happened he never he never met white people because people have always said well they went into the fort didn't they fort Merrimy and must have took picture or something no, it was like they didn't go there it was like the only time they seen uh, a non-indian was was combat they came out to Dayton to get Hump and Crazy Horse to come in to surrender. Well, not surrender, but accept some of the, the gifts, trinkets and that. And they had uh, showed some of the trinkets and probably, you know, some weapons probably do. And, and Hump looked at that hat I had and he pulled out his knife. And I didn't bring him a big knife, but they had shoulder blade knives. Some of them were up to this long with rawhide sheaths. We have five of them from the Smithsonian, including Hump, Crazy Horse, Touch of Cloud, Bigfoot, and Old Crazy Horse, Worm. They're nice. But anyway, uh, he took his knife out of that bone knife. And he stuck two holes down through that hat, and he pulled the hat over the horse's head, <laughs> and everybody remembered and recorded a big that horse went wild and everybody was <laughs> hilarious laughing and I, I said that's the first rodeo in Dayton <laughs> but uh, Hump told them to go on in and take picture trinkets we're not coming in instead he uh, he went north they went north on a, uh, to the Grove on to a horse Stephen expedition Thanks again for